Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to this I See the Difference webinar. Uh, my name's Michelle and I'm going to be taking you through this live webinar this morning. So hopefully you can all hear me and see me and if you could just see the question box on your right hand side and if you're having any problems hearing or seeing me or seeing the PowerPoint slide, the purple PowerPoint slide in front of you, please just drop a note in the question box to let us know. Um, I'm not coming to you live today on my own. I'm really delighted that I've got a guest speaker with me today, a panelist, and she is an allied health professional herself, and she's a speech and language therapist, Lorette. So she'll be joining me in a little while just to share with you her experience of working as an allied health professional. I've also got George with me, who's doing a fantastic job of organising all the technical side of this live webinar and helping you out. So, George, would you be able to introduce yourself today to our audience? Yeah, so hi everyone. Uh, as Michelle said, I'm George. Uh, so I'm going to be in the background today, uh, helping with any issues that we have with the tech um, and also taking any of your questions that you have throughout the webinar. Um, and then depending on how many we have, I'll either save them for the end and put them to Michelle um, and our guest speaker or uh, I'll answer them as we're going as well depending on numbers as Michelle said you should be able to see a box on your right hand side to send any questions through or if you're on a tablet you can see a little question mark button which you can press to send any questions through as well that's great thank you George um, What's really important to us is that we make this webinar as useful to you as possible. So we'd love to hear your feedback. So you will get an email after this webinar to ask for some evaluation. Now, I know sometimes questionnaires can be a bit boring to fill in, but we really do want to make these useful to our audience. So if there's things that you really liked about it or things that you think we could do better, please either fill out the evaluation that you get by email or just drop us um, an email to our email address that you'll see at the end of this PowerPoint session. Um, and just let us know something you liked about it or something you didn't like. So I'm just going to chat for a moment while we're waiting um, for a few more of our audience members who are probably trying to get through to this webinar. But just to check, if you have joined me live today, what you're expecting is an introduction to what the allied health professionals are. So that's what I'm going to be covering with you this morning. Now, as you can see, I am beaming live from my dining room um, and that's partly because of the social distancing measures. Us as a team, the I See The Difference outreach team, we often go into schools, into colleges, um, we do live corporate careers events, and we are a team with all sorts of experience. My background is I actually worked as an allied health professional for over 20 years. I'm still in that profession as a therapeutic radiographer. My colleague George is based up at the University of Liverpool and he's got lots of experience of working with students in the recruitment side and understanding of how UCAS works. He also knows all about orthoptics that as an AHP profession and he's employed by the College of Podiatry. I'm employed by the Society of Radiographers who are the organisation who support all the best practice, education and guidance about the radiography professions. That's diagnostic and therapeutic radiography. So I hope there's no technical glitches, but as I said, we're live. So if you have to pause or, or try and adjust anything, then we will do that. But I will talk you through as we go. So I think it's worth now getting started. So you'll see on the screen, there's a slide saying jobs that make a difference to people's lives. And I'm wondering whether have any of you out there heard of allied health professionals or even know what we do. So what are we going to be covering today? So I'd like to introduce you to the 15 different types of jobs that come under this term allied health professional. Some of you might not know what an AHP or allied health professional is. Um, some of you might, you might know a little bit about it, but hopefully you'll go away from this webinar and understand more about what we do in the healthcare sector. I'm going to share with you what I think and what our team thinks are some of the benefits of becoming an allied health professional, whether you're a young student at school, um, whether you're a careers advisor, a teacher who wants to uh, advise people about these jobs that you might not have heard of, or perhaps you're a career changer, perhaps you're working out in the job sector and you like the idea of doing something completely different. Maybe you've seen all the wonderful impact that many allied health professionals and healthcare workers have had managing this coronavirus the last few months, as well as doing all their other extremely important healthcare work. 
And then towards the end, I'm going to be introducing you to a speech and language therapist, Lorette, who's going to join us on this live webinar, sharing with you a bit about her work and what she does and her experience. It's a really great opportunity for you to ask anything and everything of Lorette, or I might be able to help you or George with any questions you might have. So don't be shy, no questions a silly question. Please either, either drop them in the question box and we'll take those at the end, or George will help you out as we go through the webinar. So all you need to do is just sit back, relax, and hopefully listen to something that will be interesting for you. So first and importantly, what do allied health professionals do? Well, we provide rehabilitation, health care and support for all sorts of people, members of the public who've got perhaps a disability, an illness, or it could be an unexpected injury. And we try and help people live their lives as full as potential as possible. And we see a broad range and caseload of patients. What's important to say is we are not nurses or doctors. And a lot of people, when they think about healthcare, assume, oh, I know what a nurse does or a doctor does, but they don't even know about these 15 other jobs. Collectively, these 15 clinical type jobs make up about a third of the clinical workforce that work mainly in the NHS, but sometimes in the private healthcare sector too. And a third is a really big number. Now, what that doesn't include is all the other hundreds of jobs in the NHS and private healthcare who are administration workers, ambulance drivers, technical support, ICT. There's all sorts of other jobs. We are talking about clinical jobs here. So these are all under the allied health professional title and name. And there are 15 individual specific jobs. So what are those jobs? Now up on the screen, you can see a series of bubbles. And I wonder if you've heard of some of those job titles. So I'll give you a moment to take a little look at those on the screen. Now I would predict that some of you on this webinar have heard of perhaps a physiotherapist, somebody who works with um, musculoskeletal sports injuries, health injuries, chronic illness that needs rehabilitation of the musculoskeletal system. But perhaps you haven't heard of an osteopath. Maybe you haven't heard of an orthoptist. Perhaps you haven't really heard much about what speech and language therapists do, which is what we're going to hear more about later on in the presentation. So there are 15 jobs and hopefully this webinar will give you information about a glimpse of some of these. And we've also got all sorts of other resources you can look at to find out more in detail if one of these jobs appeals to you. So why might you want to be an allied health professional? So every single one of those jobs on that screen has some very clear benefits. First and foremost, if you decide to go into one of these job sectors, you are likely to get a job very, very quickly. I'll talk a little bit in a moment about what the training process is if these jobs do interest you. But what's important to remember is over 90% of people who graduate with an allied health professional degree or degree level apprenticeship, go on to get a job in their chosen profession. And that's really great because there are a lot of training courses and degrees out there that whilst they're extremely interesting and valuable, they won't necessarily mean you end up qualified to do a specific job. So if I take my story, for example, I qualified quite some time ago. I went to Cardiff University for three years to train as a therapeutic radiographer. Once I'd completed all my exams, coursework training and clinical training throughout the degree, when I qualified in July 1997, two weeks later, I was employed in a busy working hospital in London, working and earning money. I had all the skills. I'd been given all the mentoring and support to be able to do that job. And I got a job really, really quickly. So and that is still the case with allied health professional jobs. What I would say is if you're particularly restricted with where you want to work, you might not get a job immediately. So, for example, if you train somewhere like, I don't know, Ipswich in East Anglia and you only want to work at the Ipswich Hospital, then you might not get a job immediately once you've qualified. You might need to spread your wings a little bit and travel to another part of East Anglia or another part of the UK to get your first job. Once you've got a couple of years post your training in a job, you're going to be able to move around quite easily. But because a lot of people don't know about allied health professional jobs, there is quite a shortage in a number of these jobs in the UK. The good news is you can choose from either working in the NHS or the private sector. 
Most allied health professionals tend to work in the NHS, particularly in the first few years of their job. There is one or two exceptions. Osteopaths, for example, although they are professionally registered, as are all the HP jobs, they're not so much in the mainstream NHS yet. They're getting there. They are often referred through the NHS, but they are usually in private healthcare setups. So with many of these AHP jobs, once you're qualified in that particular job, so maybe you're a diagnostic radiographer or maybe you're a podiatrist, you can then specialise in an area that particularly interests you. So there's lots of speciality and diversity once you train in that particular job. And the important thing is we generally work core hours. So this is quite different to maybe a nurse or a doctor who quite often will be doing shift work patterns. Again, there's always a couple of exceptions, which might be a paramedic or a diagnostic radiographer. So they often do shift work because we know we need experienced technical people working out on ambulance crews um, who need to cover that service 24 seven. We never know when someone's gonna have an immediate illness or injury and needs emergency attention. Same with diagnostic radiographers, which are a completely different job to what I do as therapeutic radiographers. They may do shift work because they work in all different areas of the hospital. So, for example, many diagnostic radiographers were required to manage and support patients with coronavirus. They were taking CT scan pictures, diagnosing what's going on inside the body with images. Um, so they were needed to go out doing chest X-rays on wards, um, but also base themselves in CT scanning units whilst patients were being brought in, as well as all the other injuries and illness that they normally look at with imaging equipment. So generally, AHPs will work core hours, except paramedics and diagnostic radiographers. Often the entrance requirement to get onto a training course is if you're going the A-level route first, you would probably need a minimum on average of three C's and above. And quite often with one science subject required, but that could be a core pure science like biology, physics or chemistry, but it could also be maybe a social science like psychology. Perhaps you're a career changer, so you might need to do some studies before you enter into a course. So you might do an access to science course, or you could be going a BTEC route in health and, and social studies or health and science. Each job and each university course or apprenticeship degree course that provides training for these jobs have their own entrance requirements. Now, I know that might be a bit daunting, but our website, www.icthedifference.co.uk, and I'll show that at the end on our slide, has really useful information that will take you through to where each of the colleges are that provide training. So for example, if you're looking at speech and language therapy, you can go on our website and on our interactive map, and it will tell you where in the UK you can train in speech and language therapy. Now, finally, a little bit about finance and funding, some really fantastic news because it's recognized that there are not enough allied health professionals. Some of these jobs where there is a huge shortage in the UK are offering NHS grant funding. And I'll share a little bit more about that in a moment, but there is some free non-repayable grant funding available as of September 2020, which is great news for those of you who need that important lift or boost to your finance whilst you're going through your really important training courses. So I've got a set of bubbles again on the screen. So that shows you the 15 jobs again. But the ones that are highlighted there in purple are definitely eligible for up to £5,000 a year free non-repayable grant. And there are links on our website that tell you how you can go about applying for those grants as part of applying for a specific AHP course. Unfortunately, there are four on there that don't offer grants just yet, but maybe that will come in the future. But it is recognised to get people into those other jobs. There are grants available. Furthermore. Therapeutic radiography, prosthetists and orthotists, a little bit of a tongue twister, podiatrists, orthoptists and diagnostic radiographers are entitled to an extra thousand pounds. And that's again because those jobs are particularly not well known. So there just simply are enough people applying for them. They're very rewarding jobs, just like all of the jobs on the screen. So whichever career you might pick on that screen, you are going to really enjoy. But those ones, because they're not heard of, there's an extra lift, an extra incentive to get people onto those training programmes. So I'm going to flip a little bit and just share with you a bit of information about if finance particularly interests you. So one of the questions that young people or career changers or careers advisors often ask me is, what are you going to earn working in the NHS in one of these AHP jobs? 
So on the screen there, you can see a table, and if you haven't heard of it, this is called the NHS Agenda for Change Pay Scale, okay? So what it does is every job, so say for example, you are an orthoptist, every newly qualified AHP will usually start off on a band five salary. So you can see the top layer there. Um, and that means you will be earning just under 24 and a half thousand pounds a year. And just to give you some background, that is about an approximate UK average salary. So pretty good really for a brand new newly qualified graduate from a degree apprenticeship or from a Bachelor of Science degree in one of these AHP subjects. That can go up increments within that band five bracket. So you can see how high it goes up there. Now, once someone has been qualified, maybe two to three years, quite often they'll apply for a promotion, another job at band six level. So on average, an AHP will end up within that band six bracket. There does need to be a job available to apply to. So if you're working in a community centre or a clinic or a hospital, because AHPs work in all different areas of healthcare, you um, a job would need to come up and you would then need to apply for it to go into these higher bandings. At the sort of band seven level, so if we take therapeutic radiography where you're earning just under 37 and a half hours and upwards, you would probably need to have done some further training or got a lot more further experience in your profession. So perhaps you're leading a small team. Maybe you've done some master's level studies in a particular speciality. So, for example, in therapeutic radiography, perhaps you've gone on and done some master's levels in radiotherapy and oncology, which is the study of cancer care in a particular type of cancer. Perhaps you've gone into education or leadership and management. So you've got a bit more responsibility and a lot more experience to be getting into that higher pay banding. Beyond that, on into 8A and 8B, again, a lot more speciality experience. Maybe you're working at what we call a consultant level. So some people have done PhDs and further studies. Or if you've gone on and leadership and management is really exciting to you. Um, I know someone down in London, for example, who's almost at exec board level. So they're dealing with lots of different departments and teams, not just in cancer care for therapeutic radiography. And they're more at the 8B, 8C salary bracket. So a lot more responsibility and experience and in the profession longer. OK, you could potentially go right up to band nine, but again, you would have got a lot more speciality expertise or perhaps you're working in the private healthcare sector because there are some jobs. So, for example, physiotherapists, osteopaths, sometimes you'll get occupational therapists. They will be going into private healthcare. Um, there are more services popping up that are private because that's the way some of healthcare is going these days. Um, so your salaries could be a little bit more competitive because it's different to what the NHS pay. But most AHPs work within the NHS, particularly in the first few years of their career. If it's like me, for example, I spent all of it apart from three years of my career working within the NHS. So what I'm going to do now is give you a furthermore, just a little touch on a glimpse of information about each of those AHP jobs. And what we've done is try to categorise them a little bit to help it be more useful to, for you to understand these different jobs if you haven't got a clue about any of them. So although we've put them in categories, what I would say is some of them do link. So just because on the screen you can see I've highlighted three specific creative type jobs. So if, if, if naturally you're extremely interested in creative arts, these three HP healthcare jobs might be of interest to you, but that doesn't mean that you don't need to be creative as a therapeutic radiography um, uh, worker or as a physiotherapist in what your job is about, but these are focused more in these areas. So on the screen, you can see art therapists, drama therapists and music therapists, individual jobs, individual training. Now for those, you wouldn't do them at degree level, you would do them at postgraduate level. So to get into those jobs, you would need to have usually done um, a creative degree initially in that subject, such as music. Then you would go on and do a postgraduate degree in music therapy. And fundamentally, what each of these jobs are doing is using their creative subject, their media, to help people communicate. Now, that person might have had an injury or an illness that's affecting communication. Quite often, they've got mental health problems. So, for example, an art therapist may work... Um, in could be based out in a prison service, helping um, people who are struggling with mental health as well as being obviously in prison for different reasons. So they're using their art to come to terms with what's going on in their life to deal with their mental health issues. 
Similar to drama therapists, they could be working in um, as part of psychology services and in community clinics based in hospitals. Um, they could be working in rehabilitation centres and that applies to music therapists too. As I said, often with mental health, but could be injuries, could be children or adults for all of these jobs um, who might be struggling with mental health or communication, helping them come to terms with something that perhaps has been a little bit traumatic or as I said, perhaps they've got a depression or something um, illness-wise that's affecting them. Each of those therapists might see a patient every day or every few sessions for a series of weeks, or they could be seeing them over a lifetime of illness and really building that trust and rapport. So communication is absolutely critical for those three very creative jobs. The next section, I talked about the mental health focus and the art therapist, drama and music are within that bracket, but often dietitians, occupational therapists and speech and language therapists will often work with people who do have mental health difficulties. It could be that specifically why they're coming to treatment at a particular service, or it could be it's running alongside another health condition or injury that they've already had that needs support by that particular AHP job. And obviously Lorette, who's going to join us later, can share with you about her role at working in speech and language therapy. Occupational therapists, if you haven't heard of that job, they actually work rehabilitating people either at their, in their home setting um, to help them adjust to their life, maybe due to an illness or injury, quite often with adults or people with learning disabilities, um, or they might be working, visiting them on the actual, in the hospital ward or clinic, making sure they're working, perhaps coordinating their rehabilitation with physiotherapists, or making sure they've got a package of care with social workers. So there's kind of a, a holistic way they're looking at that particular patient, looking at their overall care needs, making sure they can adjust to their normal life setup at home or at work. They could be working perhaps with someone who's had a stroke and isn't able to move their body in the same way. So even simple things in life that make a huge difference, like preparing a meal or a cup of tea is something that a patient needs support and advice about how to do differently and how to motivate them if they're struggling to um, sort of get back up to where they need and to live the fullest life possible. Dietitians, really important specialists in nut nutrition and diet. And that isn't just about giving healthy eating advice. Um, they could be working on all sorts of things. They could be working behind the scenes to produce communication information and literature. They could be working on wards in clinics as part of a GP practice. Um, as a therapeutic radiographer, I worked in cancer care. I used to work directly with dietitians who work with cancer patients who, whilst they might be struggling to maintain nutrition due to side effects of treatment, they also need to keep a balanced diet to keep their body healthy and well. So we would work with dietitians who understood about the cancer illness, but also what those specialist diet needs are um, to adjust to the treatments they're having and the side effects. So really important role. They could be working in the media, providing expert advice. Um, all sorts of areas um, is where dietitians will work, not just in a hospital setting. So the next group, how we've clustered them, is the sort of jobs, the AHP jobs that often have biology as their background. So if biological sciences interests you, these, these jobs highlighted on the screen may be something to consider researching. So we've got diagnostic radiography on there. Very different job to therapeutic radiography, totally different. Might be the radiography job you've heard more about. So the clues in the title, diagnostic, diagnosing. The main similarity between diagnostic and therapeutic is that we both use quite often in our work radiation. OK, it's very safe for us to use. It's important role for what patients need. Diagnostic radiographers use radiation equipment, X-ray machines, CT scanners and other non-radiation equipment to image inside the body. So they're helping other health professionals or doctors, nurses diagnose what is going on inside that body. So they might be working in accident emergency and someone gets rushed in with something like a car accident. They need to pay detailed images, perhaps on a CT scanner or with an X-ray or visit a patient on a ward with an X-ray unit and actually take really important images. So they need to be able to communicate with a patient who could be distressed or they might be working with a very busy team who are trying to deal with critical injuries. Likewise, they might be working in ultrasound, so based out in a clinic, screening new babies who haven't been born yet inside the mother's womb, or providing ultrasound screening of other anatomy parts of the body. So they're called ultrasonographers. So they're usually diagnostic radiographers initially and then train in ultrasonography, which is a specialist area. 
Diagnostic radiographers work in all sorts of clinics, hospital settings, therapeutic radiographers such as myself, we work with cancer speciality. So we're part of a radiotherapy service in a cancer care unit. So not all hospitals have a radiotherapy service. And on the screen there, another job that's sort of got a biology background is operating department practitioners. And they are working in surgical teams. So in theatres, in hospitals and clinic areas, coordinating everything that goes on in surgical theatres. So they're working with nurses, anaesthetists who give specialists anaesthetics, who are doctors, the surgeons themselves, um, and other technicians who come together to make sure all the procedures are working properly for a surgical procedure. So they will see patients right at the beginning before they've had their anaesthetic. They need to communicate with families, make sure the surgical theatre is set up ready. Um, so a really valuable and important job with lots of specialist expertise and training required. Then you've got osteopaths as well, who I mentioned work very much in the private sector, um, get a little bit confused sometimes by people that they do a similar job to um, physiotherapists. What osteopaths are doing is looking at the whole muscular skeletal system, the scaffolding, the kind of spinal um, uh, bones and also all the muscles, ligaments, tendons, and how that affects the rest of the physiology. Physiology being how the rest of the body works and operates. So they will provide specialist advice to someone who's got an injury or a chronic muscular skeletal in, in illness. So for example, I've got a neck and shoulder problem at the moment, could be caused from too much um, not having the right posture or desk work that's that's causing me some issues. I'm seeing an osteopath who's giving me some massage treatment specialist exercises. So similar to some of the work that physiotherapists do, but they're working very much on the whole body system, whereas um, physiotherapists will focus on specialist treatments, exercise, um, looking at lifestyle as well. So they, you can see there's a little bit of similarity, um, but you can find more detail on our website about those two jobs. Paramedics, I haven't mentioned them too much yet, but you're probably already aware if you've seen things like Holby City, that isn't quite how real life is obviously, but paramedics work out on ambulance crews. They're not simply ambulance dri drivers, they've got really specialist um, experience. They understand about sometimes giving drugs, emergency attention right on the scene of an accident or somebody who's been called to a home because they've got an injury or illness. So again, they've been working all throughout coronavirus, not only you know, getting to people who might have gone down suddenly with virus or a patient who's worried and called the ambulance service. We'd hope they go through the GP first, but if they haven't in this emergency, or they might be on the scene, you know, it could be all hours of the day and night, um, working on ambulance crews, working on helicopters sometimes, also working in call centres, giving important specialist advice over the phone. So we highlighted these two jobs as being high pressure. Now you can go under high pressure, working in any of these jobs on the screen, but these two particularly have quite unexpected work as their day-to-day -day job. So as I said, paramedics could be dealing with anything and everything, could go through lots of call outs in one day, which is extremely busy, high adrenaline and high pressure. Same with the operating department practitioners in surgical theatres, might be scheduled surgery they're dealing with, but it might be a series of emergencies that need theatre procedures very quickly. So it's high pressure just because it can be quite a very unexpected day. But then likewise in therapeutic radiography, although we have booked patients up to 35, 40 patients a day, um, sometimes it can be high pressure if things don't go to plan or there's equipment failure and we need to stop and pause, get that fixed and then carry on treating our busy workload of patients. Now the last category, physics. So if the science physics subject really excites you, um, I would recommend you explore these four jobs because they use physics in a lot of their day-to-day -day work. So I count myself as that's therapeutic radiography. Now I didn't actually like physics that much at school, although I got the required level, didn't do it A level, but really enjoyed the physics I learned about in my training. I had to understand all about how x-rays are produced, how these huge fascinating bits of technology that I'll show you in a moment are used. So physics was an important part of the job. Same with prosthetists and orthotists. It's all about engineering and how physics and science work to produce um, equipment that helps them habilitate someone who's got a limb missing. Diagnostic radiography, learning about x-rays and how they work for some of the kit we use. And orthoptists who deal with eye conditions. And I'll speak about that in a moment. Oh, what I forgot to mention, this last category, I said the last one was last, so apologies for that. Sporty base. If sports scientists excite you in your career, if you're already in a job or perhaps if you're at school or college, um, 
please have a look at physiotherapists and what they do. You might have seen, you might have been watching a live football match over the last couple of years and seen someone run on the pitch when there's a sporting injury. That could have been a physiotherapist. It may also have been a podiatrist who are specialists in lower limb conditions. Um, physiotherapists work out in hospital centres, clinic services too. Podiatrists, as I said, lower limb conditions, and I've mentioned the other two jobs on the screen. Engineering based, particularly prosthetists and orthotists, because they are making high tech technology to replace a missing limb. And the four on the screen here are the ones that often, if I'm chatting to young people or careers advisors or teachers, they don't really know much about what we do. So because of that, here's a little bit of information just in case you didn't know. There are four jobs that we started off promoting quite heavily for this campaign because people didn't know about them and because there's such a shortage in the UK. So an orthoptist might be a word you haven't heard of. I hadn't heard of them before I started this job, even though I work in healthcare. They're not an optician but they do diagnose and treat different conditions of the eye. So they're really looking at how the brain works, the neuroscience of the brain and how that interacts with the eye. So if eyes and the anatomy and physiology of the eyes is something that you find really interesting, an orthoptist job might be something for you. They're experts in how the eyes move and work together. And they specialize in assessing the visual function, particularly in children um, and often those with communication difficulties. So, they might be dealing with something like double vision where someone needs a correction um, which is not done by glasses or perhaps they have something more serious like a brain tumour that's affecting that eye condition or dealing with a la la what we call a lazy eye which is where one eye isn't quite working the same and there's a problem with nerve development so they'll be prescribing some specific exercise for that child or adult or person they might see a child all through they might be visiting them at school or in a clinic attached to a GP service or community clinic or based day to day out in the hospital. So moving swiftly on, podiatrists, what do they do? Well, they really take care of anything below the knee down. OK, so not just things on the foot. People often assume they only deal with things like verrucas or warts or problems on the feet. Yes, they do deal with that. There's a basic element to most jobs, but they also do with more things like rehabilitation for dancers or athletes, making sure that the move, or movement, the posture of the foot is all correct. There's specialist exercises that are required, making sure the ankle mobility is correct. So really learning about all the anatomy and the physiology about that in a lot of depth and working alongside sometimes doctors or physiotherapists. And sometimes if the patient's got something, perhaps they've got an illness or injury to the leg, they want to reduce the chance of something more serious like an amputation. So again, they can be really having an essential role in making a difference to someone's life. What do prosthetists and orthotists do? You can see on the picture there, um, really um, a hands-on engineering technical job, communicating sensitively with patients, but that patient might have been born without a limb. OK, so they need to create something which is like the scaffolding to the limb, which is called an orthosis, orthosis, apologies for the tongue twister, or prosthesis. So that's the artificial part of the limb. And this fascinating technology they have to work in, within workshops. You can get things like a limb that can be communicated via Bluetooth technology. So again, if physics and engineering interest you, but talking, communicating with patients sensitively, especially if they've been, you know, had something distressing like an amputation, you need to be really sensitive and care about people and what you do. Lastly, therapeutic radiographies. I've touched on this already, therapeutic radiographers. This is my job. This is what I've been doing for, throughout my career. We use radiation to target and destroy cancer cells, tumour cells. Now, the patients we meet, they might have had a cancer diagnosis and be quite worried or anxious. There are over 200 different types of cancer. And the fantastic news is that many of these cancer illnesses are very treatable. So most of the patients I work with are outpatients. We might see people 30 to 40 patients a day. They don't necessarily look like they've got a cancer illness. They may be quite fit and well health wise to look at. Most people we work with are adults. We do treat some children who've got um, cancer illnesses, but quite often children's the types of cancers they get are treated with things like chemotherapy, which treats the whole body system, not radiotherapy, which is radiation treating a very focused specific area. But because we often have to give radiotherapy every day for up to seven weeks, sometimes um, we meet the patients every day. So we get to know them, um, what they're going through, what support and advice they need. We also meet their friends and families and the people caring for them during that time. 
So it's a real blend of highly advanced technical equipment, which you can see on the picture there. So that's a typical what we call a linear accelerator, a huge bit of X-ray equipment, which uses radiotherapy X-ray live radiation, which then disappears after the electrical current produces the radiation. Patient gets on the couch and we have to move them up, line them up really, really accurately. So very busy physical job. But if you enjoy technical work, if you like the idea of computer software, but also patient rapport, communication and caring for people, this type of work might be for you. We're normally based in a radiotherapy department as part of a cancer service, a cancer treatment service, working behind the scenes somewhere with all the computer software. So not actually seeing the patients, but actually mapping out and planning how we give the treatments. But we could be working in the charitable, charitable sector like Macmillan or Cancer Backup UK, giving specialist literature advice and information to patients with cancer care. Perhaps you went into training or education like I did. So I worked in a university setting as well as a clinical department, teaching and training, supporting students and other visitors to the department to learn all about therapeutic radiography. I'm doing this job now, so I don't wear a uniform, but I could go back to my clinical work if I wanted to. I keep my skills up. Um, and I can go back and work in cancer care if I wish to. So I'm coming towards the end of my slides now. So in a moment, I'll be introducing you to the Lorette. But just importantly, just to bear in mind, all the work that these allied health professionals do is really, really rewarding. And I would predict that all of you listening out there, at some point, your life has already been impacted by an AHP. There's a picture down there on the bottom right. That's actually a digitally ultrasound picture of a small baby inside the mother's womb. Now, depending on how old you are, it may well be that there were ultrasound pictures taken of you when you were a baby inside your mum's womb. So you've already met a diagnostic radiographer, an ultrasonographer, who's made a difference to make sure that you were growing healthily and naturally inside your mum's womb. We see directly the difference we make to people's lives. Um, as it happens, our campaign is called I See the Difference. And that isn't some fancy marketing term. The reason it's called that is because, yes, we did work with a marketing company to help produce and raise awareness of these jobs. But lots of allied health professionals like myself and Lorette, who you're going to meet in a moment, were interviewed to ask. They were either students or they had been in the career a long time, like myself. And they were asked, why do we do our work? What's the best thing about it? What keeps us in these careers for a long time? And the fundamental thing that came back is we find the job incredibly rewarding. And actually what you're doing day to day is seeing the difference you make to someone's life. You might be doing some desk based work, but most of it is very active. You're out and about working in all different wonderful settings, not just hospital services. And you're making a difference. You know, if I work in cancer care, I'm helping cure someone's cancer or I'm helping easing their symptoms if they can't get better. There's some pictures there on the right hand side. I've got a picture of some patients I work with who are willing to share their photograph. Some gentlemen who we had to treat for prostate cancer. They didn't know each other before they started treating treatment. I still remember them, a lovely bunch of gentlemen who met in the waiting room met every day, supported each other whilst they were going through their radiotherapy. Um, and they really built that wonderful rapport. And we saw that and we really worked with them and their families as they got through their important cancer care treatment. The picture in the middle, that gentleman there is called Mafus. He's on our website and he's talking live to you. He's a therapeutic radiographer about what we love about our job. And you can see there the picture on the left, if you're working with children or making a difference, helping someone recover. As I said, you can really see that. And some radiographers there in the bottom left. Now, I know I'm biased because I work in the radiography world, but I just happen to have pictures to share with you. Um, that's two radiographers working on a CT scanner out there dealing with coronavirus, as well as all the other health conditions and injury, just sending out one of the many media pictures to thank people for their support during that time. But importantly, allied health professions are not just dealing with coronavirus, they are dealing with all the other injuries and illness. And that importantly leads me to shush now and stop chatting on and introduce you to someone who's really important in the speech and language and therapy world. And her name is um, Lorette Tamasian Zanar, and she's I'm absolutely delighted she's joining us today. So she's just going to set up some of the tech. Um, hopefully, she's going to be able to share her webcam and her Hi, microphone. Everyone. Here she is. Hello, Lorette. Hi there. Can, can you hear me to... okay? I can hear you really well. I'll just check with George, our technical um, fantastic assistant. George, can you hear and can we see you, Lorette? Have you popped mm -hmm. your camera on? 
Uh -huh. Are you willing to do that? As far as I can tell from my end, yep, everything seems to be working okay. Brilliant. So, Lorette, um, just to check with you today, are you sharing any slides with us or are you just going to chat with us on this webinar today? Yeah, so I thought just just a really informal chat today, really. Um, Lovely. I know that you've, you've done your presentation, Michelle, so I just thought um, just rest everyone's eyes and just just listen to us having an informal chat, really, about my role as a speech therapist. Brilliant. OK, so um, is there anything specific you'd like to share or would you like me to ask you some questions? What works best for you? I'm, I'm completely flexible. Um, you can just ask away and I'll, I'll try and answer. And, and, sure. and if anyone's got any questions, then I can try and answer their questions as well. Yeah, that'd be great. So before I hand over to George, you might be picking up the questions from our live audience. Could you just tell us a little bit, because I didn't touch on it because I knew you're the expert. What does, um, could you just share a little bit of insight of what you do as a speech and language therapist? Yes, well, it's an um, extremely varied job. Um, so basically speech and language therapists work with children or adults um, with speech, language, communication or swallowing difficulties. Um, so I know probably this, this kind of stereotypical image that a lot of people might have is that we, we work with children, with stammers, um, we help them to talk if they're a little bit delayed in their language, um, which is definitely what we do do. Um, but we also work with a wide range of individuals with, with problems and difficulties with their speech and swallowing for different reasons. Um, so for example, people might be born with difficulties so cerebral palsy or down syndrome and um, people might be diagnosed with autism so we would help them with their communication and their social interaction skills and um, people might have a learning disability and um, so we would go into their schools their education settings we might help them in their home environment as well with their parents something that so I'm an adult speech and language therapist, so I only work with adults um, and I have done ever since uh, my career started. It was just an area that really interested me. So I just went straight in. Um, so in my role, I work with um, just adults. So across the adult range, so for example, young adults all the way up to up much older people and people at the end of life or people um, under palliative care. So, for example, somebody might have had a stroke um, or a traumatic brain injury. Somebody might have a, a progressive disorder, for example, dementia, motor neurons disease and um, Parkinson's. And people might have respiratory conditions. Um, so they find it quite difficult to speak or to swallow. Um, and I also work a lot with um, head and neck people diagnosed with head and neck cancer so if, if somebody's got a tumour um, or you know as you were saying about your role before Michelle if, if somebody's undergone radiography then that might affect mus the muscles so we would rehabilitate them and um, something that I did want to touch upon um, is that a lot of people think obviously with our, the title we're a speech and language therapist um, a lot of people think we just deal with speech and language, um, but a large part of my job is working with people with swallowing difficulties. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, what's that got to do with speech and language therapy? Well, if you can imagine, so for example, a physiotherapy might treat somebody who's um, had a broken hip or a broken leg. So they might rehabilitate them to be able to walk again because the muscles um, have had some weakness or damage. Well, if you can imagine the throat area and how we swallow, the throat area is made up of lots of different muscles. And um, so if we've had an injury, for example, if we've if we've had a stroke or if we've had a traumatic brain injury, or as I mentioned before, if you've had radio radiotherapy to your neck area, if you've had cancer, then your muscles are going to be really weak and not working as well. So the risk of that is if you have something to drink or if you have something to eat, that food and drink might, if your muscles are not working as effectively, go into your lungs. And if the food and drink goes into your lungs, you might you might cough, you might choke, you might develop chest infections and pneumonia. 
Um, so a large part of the speech and language therapist role, if you do work with, choose to work with adults or even children, but mainly adults, um, is that you might work with people with swallowing difficulties. So in order to sort of rehabilitate, we might recommend specific exercises for the swallow. Um, we might recommend um, that somebody has a little bit of thickener in their drink to make it easier for them to swallow and um, just give the muscles lots of time to work. Um, we also might recommend they avoid hard food. So food that's going to make them choke or be, be difficult for them to chew if they've lost sensation after a stroke, for example, um, or if they've got a tumour um, on the tongue or had a little bit of the tongue removed. It might be easier for them to have softer foods or, or blended foods. And um, so a large part of our job is, is also not only the communication side of things, um, but also the swallowing. Um, and for the past four months, I've been, so at the moment I'm a lecturer in speech and language therapy at a university, and I'm developing a course, writing a course for the University of Huddersfield in speech therapy. Um, but I, I went back to the front line, so I went back to a local trust and worked in the hospital, mainly treating people um, who have been diagnosed with coronavirus. Um, so we're seeing at the moment a lot of people, obviously coronavirus affects the lungs, affects the respiratory system. So we will be seeing a lot of people with muscular weakness, respiratory compromise. And so if they're finding it difficult to breathe because maybe they've been had ventilation, maybe they've had support with their breathing, and uh, maybe they've had a tracheostomy, which is like a, a tube to help help them breathe. And um, we're seeing a lot of, of people and individuals that have a, a lot of will need long-term rehabilitation from coronavirus. And that all falls under the remit of a speech and language therapist working in as part of that larger multidisciplinary team. Um, so it's not just you, you know, you people, children with stammers that you might, you know, that typical stereotypical view of what speech therapy does. Um, we, there's a whole range of what we can be involved in um, across a wide range of settings, whether that's in schools, with people's families, or whether it's, you know, working in the acute front line. Um, it's a whole varied role to a, a speech therapist day, depending on what interests you. Um, so <laughs> that's a kind of really brief that's summary great. of what we can do um, or what we do try and do. So. Oh, I think that's fantastic because you've clearly demonstrated to our audience, and I hope you everybody could hear that really well, that there's so much breadth, there's so much variety in your job, and it's yeah. one unique AHP job. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just wondering, because it would be lovely if just to check if, if any of our audience members have got specific questions, George, because I've got lots of other questions, because it's fascinating to hear from Lorette. So but before I do, George, have our audience got any questions? Uh, so we haven't had anything specific to speech and language therapy so far. Um, yep. So if anyone has any questions that are specific uh, for Lorette or sure. speech and language therapy, do send them in. No such thing as a stupid question. Uh, only a question you want to have an answer to. So feel free to send one through. Sure, great. And I will just towards the end before we close, I will just flash up a couple of more PowerPoints just to explain if if what Lorette's sharing today or anything I've said about AHPs generally, how just to further more points about how you can get onto those training courses. So I'd love to hear, Lorette, what, what is it you really enjoy about your job? What's the one thing that you love? So, I mean, the whole job itself. Um, I think, as you've mentioned before, Michelle, it's extremely rewarding. You know, any job in a health and care profession um, industry setting is going to be rewarding because you're um, helping to improve someone's life. And that might be, um, for example, at the, the scientific physiological level, so helping somebody to walk. But it might also just be improving the quality of life um, or educating people so I work really closely with people's families so my area of interest is in dementia so people living with dementia um, and their carers so that could be a paid carer or it could be a, a family member a relative or a friend um, and what I love is just taking that time just to explain a little bit about more about the condition a little bit about what the difficulties might be but how we can we can help people to to live 
to live better and to live well and independently and and it's about empowering others um, so working coming alongside um, people with dementia and their their families carers just to help and try and improve their quality of life a little bit um, and it's not it's not that we go in and we can cure them and take away their dementia or, or any particular condition for example motor neurons disease or someone that's had a stroke you know they will have difficulties from those diagnoses but it's about helping them to manage those difficulties um, and that might just be explaining for example a little bit about the swallowing what signs to look out for or it might be things like making communication charts, communication aids, um, how somebody can communicate better, um, looking at the whole environment as well, just to support them. And I think that, you know, if, if I can just help to reassure someone or empower them or um, improve their quality of life a little bit, then that's rewarding enough for me. And I think that's why I, I do this job. Um, and obviously now I'm going to be helping, you know, students um, to, to develop the competencies to become speech therapists because I'm so passionate about the job itself. I'd love to help others. Um, and a large part of the job and any allied health profession job is about training and education. So it might not necessarily get in those, be getting those effects, you know, instantly like that. You know, we can't give a magic tablet, or we can't give a particular exercise that's going to improve someone there and then. Um, but it's just like I say, just that education and training aspect of my role, um, which I really love. Um, and I, I should mention as well that well, there's, there's lots of different avenues for careers. So I obviously graduated, I did a, an undergrad degree in social anthropology with linguistics. And then I went on to do a two year sort of fast track in speech therapy. Um, and as part of my job when I was working in the NHS, um, I applied for a scholarship to do a master's. So I was successful in that. That was through something called the NIHR, which is the National Institute for Health Research. Um, and I was able to keep my job as a speech therapist, but go to university for 12 months and essentially get paid to do a master's degree in research methods. Um, and from that, I did a study on and some research on um, people living with dementia and their carers. Um, and next year, I'll be taking that to the next level and be doing a PhD. Um, so there's lots and lots of different avenues. There's the research side of things. Um, there's, you can get into leadership and management. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's a whole breadth that you can get into from any allied health profession job. Um, but obviously that that was the kind of route that I went down to try and further that research on things that I've seen in my clinical practice each day. Um, so you don't just need, you know, graduate and you're a speech therapist. There's lots of different strands that you can do, which is exciting in itself, because if you think about it, there's not that many jobs out there where you can get paid to, to do research and have your job. Once you finish that research, you can go back to your job and then try and input those findings, try and, and put them into practice. Um, so that's just so exciting. And it's, it's such a skill as well. You're learning different skills all the time in your job. Um, so that's something that was really important to me to be able to find a job that I could do research in. Um, and being a speech therapist and an allied health professional enabled me to do that which was great. <laughs> a bonus. That's added fantastic. Bonus. That's yeah. really given. I think sharing your story like that, Lorette, is great because it shows our audience that there is that variety. And I think you're absolutely yeah. right. The fact that a lot of workers in the NHS as AHPs, wonderful training opportunities, and you shared how your career has gone in different ways and you've gone into education and training. Yeah. As it happens, as a coincidence, I did too. We've mentioned leadership and management. I know some AHPs who work in patient safety, quality management, um, and like you said, very importantly, research. And I think when we're sharing with people who, who are considering what different jobs and careers, on the back of your point really about, some people assume they couldn't have done all these wonderful things and skills and experience. You get trained on the job, just like Lorette got trained, mentored, supervised, supported. Then she's gone on and done extra postgraduate studies. So 
you are registered as a healthcare professional mm -hmm. council individual, which means you're qualified to do a job. These are vocational training courses, whether you do it as a postgraduate route, as a degree route, or as some of them are now, degree apprenticeships. Not all AHPs offer degree apprenticeships, but some do. Um, and our website gives more information about that. So what would be really nice to hear as well, Lorette, if you don't mind sharing, because I don't mind sharing mine, we like to give our audience a balanced view. So what is it you're not so keen on about your job? Are there things that perhaps you didn't enjoy so much? Because I think it's nice to give people balanced <laughs> advice if you're willing to share something you're not so keen on. Oh, so for me, for me, for example, I don't like the repetition. So I'll be honest with our audience. Um, lots of variety in therapeutic radiography but something I occasionally got bored with with was some of the technical work we did there's a repetitive skills required but actually because it was really rewarding seeing patients I didn't mind um, but it was you're seeing the same procedure over and over again every 10-15 minutes so that side of it could be quite tricky and also with therapeutic radiography you're nearly always working in pairs and big teams I didn't mind that but if someone's likes to work more independently they might want to consider something like a physiotherapist or um, a podiatrist or an osteopath or potentially it could be speech and language therapist because although you're working with other AHPs, doctors, nurses, administration assistants, all sorts, you're leading your care if I understand that right. So yeah. what's your thoughts um, on that Lorette or what are yeah, you willing so to share? It's a tricky one I know. <laughs> yeah you put me on the uh, put me on the spot. Um, Don't I think you have to. <laughs> I think for us, um, like you mentioned, Michelle, we 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 often seen as that kind. So you you often get your physiotherapist and occupational therapist working very much hand in hand, um, together, and we're kind of seen as on the outskirts of that more as a sort of unidisciplinary team, um, and that's something that it's not something that I don't like, but it can be something that's quite frustrating. Um, I think things are changing though. Definitely, we are trying to. Um, raise our awareness. Um, another another thing that links into that is the the misunderstanding as to what a speech and language therapist is, and the importance of our role within the multi multidisciplinary team. So, for example, when medics are undertaking mental capacity assessments on wards. So, for example, if somebody doesn't understand a particular decision or a particular treatment, then it's really important that we can help them to understand and, and facilitate and support their communication. So we have a really big role in, in legal procedures, for example, mental capacity assessments, best interest meetings. And it's, it's about trying to raise awareness and educating not just, just people out there like people that might be watching this webinar, but trying to educate doctors and consultants and, and, and trying to break down those barriers um, that we're all equals in this. We've all got a part to play um, within the care of our, our service user, our patients. Um, and it's just trying to transcend those hierarchies that we as a speech therapist are just as important as a doctor or a consultant um, but they will only appreciate our role more once they better understand our role um, and I think that there's a lot of I've seen a lot of new um, newly qualified um, speech therapists very recently um, in the trust that I worked in and they're just coming in with a great enthusiasm and motivation for the job and really wanting to embed and and, and raise awareness and raise our profile and, and and show people what what is part of our remit and role um, and I think it's we're you know we're, we're really transcending those boundaries now I think we're breaking down those traditional hierarchies in in health and um, you know seeing the, the doctor and consultant up there and um, allied health professionals are a really important and fundamental part of the multidisciplinary team um, and I think that's something that it's, it can be quite challenging um, but I think there's so many fab innovative ideas that are coming coming in now and um, that when you know if people are watching this now by the time you might do your your allied health profession course and um, whatever that might be um, and you 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 do your job I think there's going to be such a big awareness better awareness better profile um, and that's just going to help your job um, a little bit more and, and feel I guess a little bit more valued and, and respected um, so I think that's something that I found quite challenging, quite difficult, um, because, you know, the, there are boring parts of everyone's job, 
it's just it's just that there's always admin and paperwork and when you see somebody you've got to explain what you do and um, there's all different you know those kind of monotonous things that you do time and time again but it's about finding your little niche finding your specialism um, and just remembering at the end of the day you're dealing with 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 children with adults with long some sometimes long-term conditions and i think if you remember that and what you're you, the value in that i think you'll you'll do well as an allied health profession that's absolutely brilliant thank you lorraine for answering so honestly um it is appreciated because i know that's not an easy question yeah. and i would echo what lorette said entirely um we do work in teams there's lots of support lots of fun you know we are dealing with serious illnesses and conditions sometimes but um, I've had a varied career as has Laurette and actually I think you can hear her enthusiasm and motivation for the job and it's great you're out there because no you're right speech and language therapists aren't always heard of or understood mm. and what you've done today has brought that you know played your part and raised awareness that's fantastic um, and keep doing that and I and I can't echo enough I used to work with some great speech and language therapists in radiotherapy yeah. it's so important and valuable the work that they did to help support the patients that are having these really tough head and neck radiotherapy treatments so ultimately to get better yeah. and we've both mentioned there are things about our jobs that aren't that exciting but there is with any job but you are not going to be out of work in an AHP job mm -hmm. the other important point that I don't think I touched on is that if you train in the UK um, your qualification is often recognised in other countries throughout the world. Now, I know we can't travel about as much with coronavirus right now, but um, you can work in other countries. I spent some time working in Australia because my qualification was recognised there. Um, and I've got friends who did joint projects out in some of the African countries to help give advice, support and training where they desperately wanted to provide good radiotherapy services, but they didn't have the funding or training support. Um, so, and I know someone who's working out as a radiographer in Canada, and that applies to many of the AHP jobs. So there are overseas opportunities, although yeah. obviously we want people in the UK working in the NHS, and I've done that through most of my career. So I think I'm just aware of time. That's been so helpful, Lorette. Um, I'm just going to switch on and just finish up on a two or three slides. And obviously you're welcome to stay for that for the last few minutes. Um, I'll just check with George. Are there any burning questions from our audience members that we haven't covered, George? Uh, no, so I think you guys have done a done a great job and covered everything as uh, we've, we haven't really had that many questions coming through, so. Sure, and often that's because, you know, if, if there are audience members, so any of you out there, if you think of a question after we finish this webinar, please drop us an email. I'll show you a slide in a moment. Um, but Lorette, thank you so much. If you do, if you don't stay to the end, I just want to say thank you for sparing time, giving up your free time to talk to us today and help this campaign to raise awareness. Um, audience, drop us an email. Um, we'll put you in touch with either Lorette or speech and language therapist colleagues. If you've got queries, we'll do that via our I See The Difference web address. Um, and I'll just finish thank up is there anything you know. finally before i finish up lorette anything you wanted to say importantly no, thank you thanks so much for inviting me today um, and i hope that was helpful to to everyone that's yeah, watching sure. um, but thank you thanks a lot everyone thank Brilliant. you well done <laughs> okay i'll just um finish off these last few slides so you heard from lorette about her sort of postgraduate training route so if you want to be an allied health professional what do you do next or importantly, research the type of job that interests you, whatever's jumped out at you today, go on our website. Um, don't worry if you can't get any work shadowing experience in a hospital or clinic, it's not gonna hold you back getting on a training course. What I would recommend you do is research through our website. There's lots of resources on there. There are YouTube films. There are people speaking live about their HP work, just like Lorette did, um, pre-recorded sessions. There is something called the Wow Show YouTube film. So if you search healthcare careers Wow Show AHP, um, you will find a film that's filming people live in action in their work. If you want to train, most people at the moment do a three year Bachelor of Science degree in their AHP job. So I did a Bachelor of Science in Therapeutic Radiography. The website shows you all the different training. You can go postgraduate route for some of them. Um, and I mentioned art therapy, music therapy and drama therapy. They're definitely postgraduate route. If you're a career changer, you might do that access to science course to show you can study at that level before you apply. 
some of the courses are offering degree apprenticeships but not all of them and there is a website to look at what apprenticeships are on offer um, importantly the training courses are a real mix of being out working in your clinical environments as well as based at university for lectures um, so that's really important it's not a sort of few hours a week lectures and the rest is free time these are quite intensive courses because you're being trained to do a job and a very rewarding job at the end so yes it's hard work you need to be relatively physically fit and well um, but you are doing that blend of lectures and studying and at the end of it you can be professionally registered to go out straight away and get a job so as I mentioned courses can be intense but it is really worth it Here's the last slide just to share with you where our website is and also our email address. We are on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram, so please follow us there. There are lots more webinars coming up over the next month or two and some pre-recorded resources that will go on our website. So if Lorette or I haven't covered what you need today, please um, feel free to get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. I hope to find out that some of you in the audience go on and train as an AHP. We desperately need more people doing this fantastic and rewarding work out there in the UK and beyond. So um, please do your research and don't rule it out if you've considered nursing or, or doctor or medical careers, which are equally rewarding, but um, don't rule these jobs out. You might not have heard of them. There's more there to learn. So that draws me to a close. Um, just want to say a huge thank you to George, who's helped make sure this has run really smoothly today and dealt with any technical issues, and also is part of the important team putting resources and presentations and info to get today. Thanks again to Lorette, you were fantastic, really useful to share your experience as a speech and language therapist. And to you, the audience, I hope you have a lovely afternoon, whatever you're up to, whether you've got school studies, college studies, working, putting your feet up, your teacher, whatever you're doing, um, enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope you have a lovely bank holiday weekend. OK, bye for now.